And if we just look in the last six years, we can count uh, coronavirus. We can count at least four chances that Ebola virus has had at becoming an, a, a widespread epidemic and a pandemic, and that includes the West African Ebola outbreak, which uh, did become a international out, uh, outbreak, and um, basically it reached other countries. And we can look at Zika virus as well, and what that did in terms of its impact to the Brazilian population and how very quickly it became endemic uh, in, in sort of the Asian region. but because it's not as perceived as an impactful disease, it has been sort of forgotten about in the media. And I think one has to uh, alert everyone to the fact that developing nations are by, by, na by almost impossibility and, and basis, required to go and interact with the wild and to resource protein from uh, wild game. And as a result of that, they will be exposed to pathogens that uh, developed nations will not be exposed on a, on a routine basis unless you're looking for people looking for exotic meats or whatnot. Uh, so we have a very, very strong chance that we will get another pandemic. Now, does it matter at this point in time where coronavirus originated from? Um, I don't think we want to be looking at this so much as the fact that within, frankly, a year, the virus that reached, in a broad sense, humanity, was able to improve itself by a thousandfold. And this is a number that has come out from experiments in uh, how to transmit itself. In other words, if, if a bunch of um, scientists were sitting there uh, trying to make a biological weapon and it all went wrong, well, clearly they weren't doing the job properly because nature found a way of doing it better. And in many ways, you know, considering how we have the capacity, if we want, to make things much more efficient in the lab before we actually take them out into the community, it makes me think, think from a completely different perspective that no, this was not a, a biological weapon created in the lab, either intentionally or accidentally. I don't think it was something that was released in the progress of study of different uh, bad pathogens with potential pandemic um, um, risk. Uh, and the reason this is additionally backed is the data that have come out with the genome of this particular virus versus the genomes of other bat viruses. And only this week we had a publication from Public Health England, uh, which reported the presence of um, very well related, not closely related, but well related uh, viruses in British bats that have 70 to 90% homology in some proteins to coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. Uh, what this tells us is this, this stuff is out there and it's just because people interact with wild animals that we become exposed to it. And the moment that interaction makes its way into a densely urban environment, it's a, it's a, it's a numbers exercise. How many opportunities does the, the, the pathogen have to move again and again and again into humans before it, you know, randomly one of those individual viruses has a capacity that to jump from human to human. And if that step is made in an urban environment, the outcome of that is a pandemic. This is where we are right now. It's not a movie from the mid 2000s, this is real life. This is exactly what's happened. the absolute weight of evidence suggests that the virus is natural of origin. It's a zoonosis, meaning that it came out of bats. Now, did it come out of bats because somebody farmed those bats or hunted those bats, or because somebody extracted the virus from the bats and was not as cautious in the laboratory 
frankly, I don't think we will be ever able to come to the bottom of this. Um, does it matter if for the future? It matters because we need to work to support communities to not need to go and feed on bats or play on the trees with fruit bats in, in West Africa and catch Ebola, for example, because that's, that's how that one started. These kind of, where does it come from questions help us understand what we need to do to prevent this from happening again. The lab lake hypothesis is a credible hypothesis because not theoretically six months before that, uh, the United States Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases um, in the United States, which I've had the luxury of collaborating with in the past, had accidentally released some uh, biological agent uh, as part of their work, and they had to shut down the labs to ensure that the practices got better. Uh, several years before, the very prestigious Perbright Institute here in the United Kingdom had also released an animal pathogen accidentally in its wastewater. We are humans, mistakes happen. Uh, what we can do is uh, take a little bit more seriously risk assessment procedures. Uh, the UK love the risk assessment procedures to perhaps sometimes ridiculous levels. Uh, but incidents like these, incidents like a, a reactor blowing up because somebody didn't flick a switch correctly, show the need that for the risk assessment to be proportionate to the risk involved. And for the individuals participating in the work, which is high risk, to be very careful, very meticulous, constantly supervised to make sure that they don't forget about something. Assuming for a moment that this was a lab leak, to be able to evidence that this was a lab leak, you would need to find the first few individuals that caught the virus and timeline the infection of those individuals uh, alongside the known now start of the outbreak to be able to say, you know what, it was that particular lab operative that got infected first, who passed it on to X, Y, and Z. And that can work if we have samples from that period. If those samples do not exist, we don't have the tools to do so. And it's, I'm afraid it's as simple as that. The, it's almost like saying that I'm, I'm looking for a fingerprint that somebody has wiped off. And in this instance, it's not that they have wiped it off, it's just that time has gone by and it's been covered up with soil and sand and there is no fingerprint anymore, okay? So this is why I'm saying that if it is a laboratory leak, unless there's a paper trail somewhere saying, oh, look, these people working in this particular setting, two or three of them, all their housemates, um, friends, family, etc., developed an unknown pneumonia, but they didn't die because they were young. And then suddenly, the uh, food market next door to where they live developed incidents of this pneumonia, then you have a potential trail, but it's still not hard evidence. We all come down with the respiratory things that never get tested for what they are on an <laughs> annual basis in our millions, if not billions, uh, across other nations. That doesn't mean that the pandemic started 15 years ago in you know, the back streets of Montpellier, for example. <laughs> okay, it, it's, it's got nothing to do with that. It's, it's, it's what that particular data set says. And in fact, the closest other pathogen that we have comes from a cave in a completely different region of China that it so happens some of the people that died from this disease early are known to have gone hunting into that cave to get bats. So it's Occam's razor. What's the simplest explanation? The simplest explanation is that these traders were hunting the bats that just happened to have the virus that just happened to infect them. It's the simplest explanation, really. I think it's very important at this point to explain what the WHO is and what it is not. The WHO is just an advisory organization. It has no policing powers, investigational powers, or anything along those lines. And the WHO is um, not controlled, but is a, it's a, a United Nations instrument, if you like. 
So when we are looking at effectively a political instrument, making, for, making certain requests and recommendations, we want to consider what are the political forces behind some of those recommendations. In this instance, there was an investigation. It involved uh, some highly respected scientists, which have no reason to say, actually, um, this was done perfectly well when it wasn't. Uh, Peter Daszak is an example of those individuals um, who were actually quite ob obvious saying, you know, we didn't see everything we would like to see. We saw, we, get, we got shown some of the things um, that we would have liked to have seen. And the consequence of those statements are gaps, gaps in our understanding and what if questions have been given fully. Unfortunately, one of the problems and the consequences of transparency is that you end up feeding the trolls. And uh, in this instance, the people who love a conspiracy theory will just jump onto that and say, ah, oh, this is what they were doing. They're hiding it. They were hiding something. Why were they hiding it? And this is just amplifying itself. So whilst the perhaps different circumstances, the WHO may have been satisfied or the committees in the WHO may have been satisfied sufficiently that the evidence is in, on balance favoring a zoonotic transmission, because we have all this clamor of demand for additional information, then we, we, we have to go and collect more information if possible to try and allay these vocal concerns. And again, it might have to do more than with politics than it has to do with science. There is no such thing as the perfect experiment. There is no such thing as the perfect evidence either. Every piece of evidence has a point at which it may start to falter. And this applies in normal, I mean, I'm not a forensic scientist, but it applies in forensic science. It applies in medicine. It applies in all sciences. Um, even you know, physicists would use ridiculous levels of evidence gathering to say, you know what, this new particle we think exists. We think it exists. You know, what is the, the confidence? Well, it's one in a, you know, in a billions, billions worth chances that this is not real, but we, we still say we think it exists. This is the level of evidence they say, and that they accept that this is just a probability and that they report it. So will we ever be able to satisfy those trolls? I don't think so. Can we do more? to try and collect more information. I think that's uh, a reasonable um, decision to take. And if uh, Chinese officials are listening to this, I would welcome a um, open arms from the Chinese authorities to say, look, this is the evidence. See what you think. And we will work with you not to, to make sure this doesn't happen again. It's not, about, it's not about who caused this. It's about what do we do to prevent this from happening again? And frankly, we should be talking about what have we learned in the last 12 months about what stops transmission? What have we learned about how we've killed flu? We literally have stopped the, the transmission of flu for a year. There's no flu around at all. Molecularly, it's not there. It's not because doctors don't diagnose it anymore. It's because the tests that no one can tell that something is, we just don't, they don't give us a, a positive result anymore. It doesn't exist at this point in time in large numbers. So what can we learn from this to improve our lifestyles and our well-being? Do I have to go to work if I'm coughing and spluttering to infect all my colleagues who will take it home, who will disrupt other businesses and schools and families and all those things? Obviously not. Do I have to pollute the environment by taking even public transport to, to, to go to work or even pushing a push bike that still needs rubber tires? You know, that is pollution. No. I can do a lot of my work from home and I shouldn't be doing it from another location for the reasons I've just explained. All these things need to be seriously taken stock of because in this year of 2021, we've experienced killer floods in the United, uh, sorry, in the, in the European Union. We've experienced Canada nearly hitting 50 degrees. We've experienced the pandemic. We've experienced the anthropopause. We've experienced all this disruption and yet all we can say is, oh, let's go back to normal. Well, normal is causing all of this. Maybe we need to change normal. That's my humble opinion. Uh, 
um, the, the absolute marvelous achievement of all these hundreds of thousands of genomes of the virus being shared openly between researchers globally from the start of the pandemic from China until now um, has helped us understand transmission, track the variants, share information about the experiments we need to do in order to understand what's going on. We need to stop thinking about individual scientist glory or individual research institution glory and need to start thinking about common good and the impact to society and economy that we have achieved positively by this open way of working. Now, there are changes that are necessary at um, international and national level that will enable this to happen. So, for example, the problem we have with the vaccine distribution pivots on sharing of knowledge how to make these vaccines, number one, and number two, the patents. The truth is, governments can waiver the patents, but if you don't know how to implement those patents into reality, all you're making, I'm sorry, is pea soup, and that's not going to achieve anything. So, you know, um, Elon Musk is not very popular, along with a few other people in the last few days, because he's wasting a lot of uh, energy going to space, as opposed to uh, helping the planet. And um, even the his views on the pandemic have been challenging at best at times. But the man did the right thing. He gave away the patents around electric vehicles when he realized that the, the impact they would have to the environment. We need to think more along the same lines. Science, we're not at the point anymore where we can just continue in the same way of working. We have to think in different ways that will allow the population, that will allow society and economy globally to benefit. Otherwise, we're up for a really rough ride over the next few decades. First of all, the, from the early days in the pandemic, the way we have changed the way we understand the virus and what it means uh, has indicated that it's a critical that scientists from different disciplines talk to each other. Those of us who have worked on virus evolution have been very, very vocal about the risks of transmission, of ongoing transmission to enabling the virus to evolve. Lo and behold, a year later, we're already running out of uh, Greek letters to identify variants of interest. Okay, that's pretty quick. And originally, um, coronavirologists thought coronaviruses don't evolve very fast. But then again, they never had the opportunity to watch them spread so quickly uh, or so broadly. So that's, that's one thing. We all... All different disciplines in science need to listen to the other disciplines in science and work together. The aerosol community has taught the medical community not to be so proud about itself and its understanding of biological science and medical science. Uh, and, you know, the airborne transmission problem has been one of those key issues here. On the back of that, the political disruption in the in the last five years, if not longer, leading on to the US elections 2016, the, the Brexit decision in the United Kingdom, the emergence of populists in Europe, in Brazil, in the States, um, you name it, across the world, created the perfect recipe for disaster in terms of managing a pandemic correctly. The few nations that listen to the scientists have actually done really, really well throughout this pandemic, including places like Vietnam, which wouldn't roll off your tongue as a, as a scientifically developed nation. Uh, I have a Vietnamese PhD student. I have huge respect for him. He's amazing. But where people don't seem to get, care about the science, and they're just ruled by ideology, the consequences of the economy and of the population are dire. And the problem with that is that Science doesn't care about ideology. The virus doesn't think. It just does what it wants to do, what it's evolved to do. And it's evolved to transmit, 
and mutate to adapt to the new settings it's presented to. This is where we are right now. We have the Delta variant where in the background of no vaccination, it was responsible for bodies running down the Ganges, 4 million extra deaths in India in the first half of 2021, practically, because in 2020, they didn't have much of a problem. In the background of vaccination, the nations who are vaccinated are seeing, are seeing 90 to 95% reduction in deaths and in hospitalizations, the numbers are, are hugely reduced, which is great news, great news. But as an evolutionary virologist, or rather, based on the work I've done on virus evolution over the last few years, I can hand on heart tell you that what we are doing in Britain right now is what I would have done in my lab if I wanted to evolve a, a virus that's resistant to a vaccine. So if, if, if something keeps me up at night about um, autumn 2021 and winter 2022 is data that will come out of some semi-vaccinated country, probably Britain, uh, where the vaccine just doesn't work anymore for some people. And again, we're not, the, the people from different disciplines are not listening. Uh, evolution, uh, evolutionary biologists are saying, why don't we go beyond the spike protein? And why don't we look at the mutation libraries that we have out there and pick and mix and match, the, match these things to make a new vaccine booster that will probably hit all these new evolution variants. And what the companies have made vaccines already are saying is, let's just give another dose of this vaccine to the already vaccinated population. I'm sorry, these people are adequately protected from these existing variants. You need to be dosing the Africans. You need to be to dosing the, the Southeast Asians. You don't need to be dosing for a third time the US and Israel and Britain and Europe. Because it's not going to achieve as much. Yes, it may reduce somewhat hospitalization uh, against the future variants, but you can't guarantee how, by how much and you can't be sure by how much or even at all because you don't know what the future variants are going to be. So you need to outsmart the virus in its own game if you want to win this. And that, the, the, the answer to that is virus evolution. But what do I know? I'm just a guy in a university in the northeast corner of the UK with the highest incidence of cases right now in my region, am I? So um, I better go back to the very few hours of sunshine that we've got left here and try and enjoy it before it disappears again. <laughs>